in this lecture, uh, I'll be talking about uh, a theorem that is crucial and central to the Lebesgue integration. It really makes a, a central uh, big difference between uh, the Riemann integration and the Lebesgue integration. Okay, so remember that we are talking about early 1900 uh, with the Lebesgue uh, contribution to the theory of measure and integration. Okay? Because once you understand what's going on on the real line, you kind of go to the abstract uh, measure theory. Uh, the core is what's going on on the real line. Uh, this theorem, known as Bigorov theorem, okay, Uh, this is, of course, the English spelling. The original Russian spelling of his name is Igorov, Dimitri. This is his first name. And this was published in 1911. Uh, earlier, this theorem was known to an Italian, uh, Ita Italian mathematician, and his name is Severini. It was published in 1910. A year earlier, uh, it was published in a, a local Italian journal, and it was written in Italian. Okay, so this is very common at that time, not 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 today, when uh, everything is available immediately over the internet. Uh, this was done around 1900, so there was no internet at that time. So it's very common that a theorem would be known to one mathematician, and then of course rediscovered by another mathematician in a totally independent way. So that's why we give credit. So this theorem in the literature is known as severini egorov theorem and sometimes uh, just as Egorov theorem. Okay? In any case, so uh, before uh, we proceed to uh, the statement of this theorem, I would like to recall something. So here it just starts by recalling some uh, basic beautiful Result, okay, on measures, a measurable set, on a measurable sets, okay. Let E be a measurable set, with measure of E finite. And what's interesting is, in fact, E can be approximate because even the theorem of Egorov is that uh, almost, you see, like almost you have something happening, a nice behavior. Okay, you have a, a, a certain behavior on uh, the entire set, almost uh, that uh, behavior can be, uh, in other words, improved into some very nice behavior. Okay, so in any case, here, if you have a set which is measurable with the finite measure, then this set is almost a union of finite open intervals. Okay, almost. Okay, so uh, let us uh, show this. So first of all, we know that for every epsilon, there exists an open set, open, such that the measure O minus e is less than epsilon, and of course we assume that, not we assume that, uh, we have that e is a subset of o, okay, so it's a bigger open set which covers e, and that its measure, the difference of the measure is less than epsilon. So now what you do, you go uh, to your o, and you know that this is a union of disjoint, uh, disjoint, open intervals. This is truly a beautiful result from real analysis. And, okay, since measure of E is finite, we get that the measure of the open set is also finite. Okay? But because the INs are disjoint open, eh, we know that the measure of O is going to be sigma the measure of i n from 1 to infinity. Okay? 
cell uh, for, for this epsilon that we have, right, the fixed epsilon, there exists capital N such that sigma from n plus 1 to infinity, the measure of i n is less than epsilon. Okay? So now we consider f to be the union uh, of i n from 1 to n. So this is a finite union of open intervals, uh, disjoint open intervals. And now let us look at now what happened to. So, and of course, uh, let us take uh, O minus F. We take O minus F is equal to the union from n plus 1 to infinity of i n. So what do we know? Obviously, we know that the measure of O minus F, this is less than epsilon. That's how we came up with the capital N. Okay? Now, which implies that the measure of uh, our original set E minus F is going to be less than epsilon because it is a subset. E is a subset of O, okay? So now, what is the measure, on the other hand, we have the measure of F minus E this is less or equal to the measure of O minus E, because F is a subset of O, which is less than epsilon. So, this implies that the measure of uh, E minus F plus the measure of F minus E is less than 2 epsilon, so it's very small, okay? Uh, if, if this part of zero, the, the, the 2 epsilon, you can go back in the original proof and put epsilon over 2 instead of epsilon, okay? So this is what we call the uh, different set, or uh, yeah, so E minus F union F minus E, this is known as the delta difference between E and E. So this is the difference between the two sets, okay? So the measure, basically, because they are, sip, they are um, each one, the measure of E, okay, delta F, this is less than 2 epsilon, okay? So it's very small. So your E is basically, your E is almost, this is the beauty, almost a finite union, this is your F, finite union of disjoint open intervals. Beautiful. Keep in mind, we use the fact that the measure of E is finite huh? uh, to, to go from countable to, uh, to finite. Okay? So th this result, in fact, is known as the, this is known as the little wood. First principle. Okay, so this is very crucial uh, for the uh, what we want to do uh, next. Okay, so uh, before we state the Ergorov theorem, let us start with uh, so so again again before I state my my theorem. So what is the story here? The story is we are looking at given. Uh, sequence Fn of measurable functions defined on a measurable set D. Okay? And the key here, which by the way, uh, we discussed it before, uh, 
uh, we can easily come up with uh, a sequence of functions fn on the real line, which uh, converge pointwise to the Dirac function, and these functions fn are uh, continuous everywhere except in, uh, on a finite number of points, and uh, we know that the Dirac function, uh, Dirac function is not is not uh, Riemann integrable. So th th what I'm going to be discussing now, we knew they knew uh, earlier that uh, this fails. Uh, uh, the property of pointwise conversions is very bad. Huh? The limits can be extremely bad uh, for Riemann integral. So here, we assume that Fn converges pointwise to F. Uh, when I say converges, okay, I mean the limit is finite. Okay, uh, some some people they include in the extended uh, concept they will include the plus infinity. For me, it's already uh, included in the word converge. When I say it's a sequence convergence, I mean the limit is finite, okay? So, uh, as I said earlier, the difference between uh, between uh, Riemann and Lebesgue integration is that, or measure, is that the limit f may not be Riemann integrable in the case of what? Riemann integration, but in the case of measure, measurable functions in the sense of Lebeck, we know, uh, we have seen that f is in fact a measure on e. Okay? Uh, this, this result uh, stays true uh, and valid if we assume almost everywhere. So we don't need to have conversions pointwise everywhere, but almost everywhere, okay? Uh, so in other words, you don't have conversions on the entire set E, but only on E minus, uh, on a subset E minus E0, where E0 has measured zero, okay? So still the result is valid, okay? So the first uh, conclusion is uh, what we, what we want to do, in fact, and what Egorov theorem uh, 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 takes care of or states is the fact that this pointwise convergence becomes a wonderful convergence, which is, by the way, uniform convergence, but on a smaller set, uh, on a smaller set, not on the entire set, but on a smaller set, okay? So for that, uh, let us study a little bit more this uh, sequence and see uh, how we can come up with some nice behavior, okay? So first is we start with the following lemma which is necessary. Assume that the measure of E is finite. Okay, under the assumption that I just described. Okay, then for every, then for every epsilon, for every delta, there exists a measurable subset E star of E such that the measure E minus E star is less than epsilon, and there exists an integer such that the soup of Fn of x minus F of x for x in E star and n greater than n is less than delta. So you see what we call the norm infinity over uh, uh, E star uh, is uh, as small as you want because this is for every delta. So there is an n such that 
the, the sequence on that set, okay? But you lose something, huh? the E star, uh, you lost a little bit from the set uh, E because you said for every epsilon, but you can make small everything. So, keep in mind that since F is measurable, okay, so we know that for every M, okay, so here, proof, it's very, very simple. Huh? So, for every n, we know that the function fn minus f is measurable. Okay? Because we said that f is measurable, and uh, with the composition of measurable functions is measurable, so we get this property. So now, what uh, we're going to do, fix epsilon and delta, positive, okay? And consider the set E n k equal x in E such that uh, f k of x minus f of x less than delta uh, sorry it has for uh, k greater than n for every k greater than okay so this is uh, en for fix n greater than one so you see uh, this is an intersection of measurable sets because we said that this absolute value of fk minus f are uh, measurable. So this set is measurable, intersection is measurable, therefore the ENs are measurable what? Subsets. Now, since the sequence fn converges pointwise to f, then what we have is that we have E is equal to the union of all the ENs. Okay? Now, uh, just by using the definition of limit, okay? Definition, definition of limit. So now, the measure of E is finite, therefore the measure of ENs is finite. So this implies that the measure of E... Ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I need to point out by definition of the ENs that we have it's very simple to notice that in fact it is an ascending sequence or increasing sequence okay for n greater than 1 and therefore now we can say that the measure of E which is finite uh, is going to be the limit of the measure of the ENs which is also the soup of the measure of the ENs. Okay? Using the properties of measure, measurable set. So now, for uh, the delta that we picked, okay? For, I'm sorry, uh, we use delta. For the epsilon, okay? For that epsilon that we picked, there exists an N such that the measure of E minus E n is less than epsilon for every n greater or equal than n. Okay? So, set E star to be the E n. Okay? So, what do we have? We have first measure of E minus E star is less than epsilon, and for every n greater than n, we have the soup of, uh, for x in E star, uh, f of x minus f of x is less than delta. I believe I did a mistake uh, let me go back uh, in the definition of the ENs, okay? Uh, yeah. No, 
So it's correct. Huh? It's not, there is no soup in the definition of the E. So excellent. So this implies that for every action E star, you have that less than epsilon. Sorry, it has to be large. Okay. Great. So. With the help of this lemma, okay, now we're ready to give the proof of Egorov theorem. Okay, so uh, we assume that the measure of E is finite, and we take the Fn, which converges pointwise to F, right? As we said before. So this is assume the measure of E is finite. And we have the sequence Fn, which converges pointwise to F, okay? Then, for every epsilon, for every epsilon, there exists, there exists F closed subset of E such that the measure of E minus F is less than epsilon and Fn converges uniformly to F on the closed set F. Okay, so how do we prove this? Uh, so what does the lemma tell us? Huh? Because the measure of E is finite, so we know that for every n, so we fix epsilon, okay? And uh, what we are gonna do is the delta, uh, we're going to pick delta small enough. So here, for every n, fix n uh, greater than 1. Okay? And we know from the that there exists, uh, that's what we did in the lemma, there exists E star, okay, uh, measurable subset of E such that the measure of E minus E star, let's call it E star n by the way, because it depends on this n that we have here. So this will be less than, not epsilon because we'll be stuck, huh? we're we are going to have a union and then we're going to add, so let's divide by, doesn't matter, 2 to the power n plus 1 or 2, whatever. Just to make it very, very small, so when we add them later on, because it's going to be a union huh, to go all the way. So, and, uh, of course, uh, f, k, ah, there exists n sub n, such that f, k of x, true, for x in e star, minus f of x, this is less than 1 over n. So the, your delta is 1 over n. So you found that, uh, so, okay, so now, let us take uh, set e tilde equals the intersection of all the e n stars, okay? So this is measurable, because it's a countable uh, 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 intersection of measurable sets, subset of E, and what do we have? We have the measure of E minus E tilde is going to be the measure of the union of E minus E n star. So that's why we needed to divide the epsilon by 2 to the power, because it's going to be less or equal than the sum, okay, of epsilon over 2 to the power n plus 1, from 1 to infinity, and this will be less than epsilon, okay? 
So now, we go to, uh, we need to prove that, we claim in fact, that Fn, the sequence Fn, converges uniformly on E tilde to F. Converges uniformly to F. Okay? And then for any delta, okay? Be careful, right? epsilon was fixed because the epsilon gave us the E tilde. So E tilde depends on epsilon. Okay? So that's fixed. Great. So now we want to show that Fn converges uniformly to F on E tilde. So we fix delta for any delta positive. Okay? We want, so here, there exists n0 such that 1 over n0 is less than delta, okay? And now, uh, we know that uh, e tilde, okay, we know that e tilde is a subset of e n0 star, okay? And we know also that for every x in E n 0 star will be, uh, we will have f k of x minus f of x less than 1 over n 0 for every k for every k greater than n of n0, okay? So what does that mean? But you know that 1 over n0 is less than delta, okay? Therefore, and e tilde is included in e n star, so what we have is that uh, for every x in e tilde, for every k greater than n, n0, yeah? Uh, we have uh, f k of x minus f of x, is less than delta, and that gives you the definition of what? Of uniform convergence of the sequence Fn to F on E tilde. Okay, so some basic remarks of this beautiful theorem. So you see, almost, we have almost uniform convergence, okay? So here, some remarks. So the first one, one may ask, what happens if the measure, so here, what if measure of E is infinite? Okay, so what happened to the conclusion, okay, if we had that? Okay, so first, let uh, E equal R, okay, and set Fn. There are many examples out there that you can see, huh? but... So the characteristic of n plus infinity, okay? So obviously, f n converges pointwise, everywhere converges pointwise to zero uh, on r, okay, on e. Great. So now, uh, assume, okay, let epsilon, Um, I, I forgot, uh, yeah, uh, I forgot to, to say something that uh, here, uh, before we, we proceed a little bit, we wanted to find a closed subset uh, on which it is uniformly convergent. So what we need to do, once we found that E tilde, which is measurable, on which you have uniform convergence, and you are almost close to, you can also approximate E tilde by a closed subset. You know that there exists F closed, such that uh, f a tilde contains f, and the measure of uh, e tilde minus f is less than epsilon. So you can have the measure on f, on capital F, you're going to find uh, uniform convergence, and uh, the, the difference of the measure between e and f is going to be 2 epsilon, and that's why. So having a, a measurable subset of e on which you have uniform convergence, 
uh, you can approximate that E tilde by a closed set and you still have uniform conversions. So, great. So let's go back here. So we know fix epsilon, sorry, fix epsilon positive. There exists F closed subset of R such that Fn converges uniformly to zero. Of course, here we are assuming true. Assume a Gorov conclusion is true. Okay? Then uh, we have this. There exists a closed subset for which you have this property. Okay? Now, uh, there exists for that epsilon, there exists uh, ah. and what is the property of F? We know that the measure and the measure of R minus F would be less than FC. Okay? Great. So now, uh, we have uh, for every... Uh, so since it is uniformly convergence, there exists N, which is greater than 1, uh, such that uh, the soup of FK of X minus f of x for x in f will be less than one half for n greater than capital N. Okay, so all of them they have the soup norm less than one half. Okay, it's going to be less than anything, any delta, but one half is enough. So remember, your f is equal to zero. Okay, and your fn are either zero or one. Okay, so as you can see, you cannot have uh, the fn is equal to 1 because we're going to have 1 minus 0 and it's not going to be less than 1 half. So this automatically implies that you have 1. fn of x is equal to 0. Okay? So what does it mean? So this implies that for every for every n greater than n, fn of x is equal to 0 for every n, for every x in f. Okay? So in other words, that for every x in f, x does not belongs to n plus infinity, which tells me that uh, f is a subset of minus infinity n. Okay? So, n plus infinity is a subset of r minus f, which, by the way, gives you your contradiction y, because this will imply that this less or equal than the measure of R minus F is less than epsilon. Okay? And this will be what? Our contradiction. Right? So as you can see, the conclusion is not valid when we take uh, when we take the measure uh, being infinite. But but this conclusion has something extremely interesting, okay? Uh, a theorem that was discovered by Luzin, by the way. Uh, what happened if uh, uh, the measure of E is infinite? We can still do something very interesting, which is the following, okay? Okay, so assume the measure of E is infinite, okay? We know that we cannot have a closed subset for which, okay? But What's going to happen here is that uh, we are going to find, so take, I'm talking about uh, uh, for every uh, epsilon, No, first, uh, let us, in order to understand the next result, let us uh, assume back to finite, okay? And uh, what's interesting is, 
So you will understand what's going on in the case of measure equal to infinity as well, okay? So we want to push a little bit. So let's use the Egorov theorem, the conclusion of Egorov theorem for every epsilon, blah, blah, blah. So let's take take epsilon equal 1 over uh, n, n greater than 1. So you know that you are going to find the closed subset at n such that the measure of e minus fn less than epsilon and uh, the sequence, okay, um, fk uh, converges uniformly to f on fn. Okay. So now, uh, look at the uh, F is the union of all the Fn's from 1 to infinity. It's a subset of E, right? And what's interesting is, what is the measure of E minus F? So this is going to be um, the measure of the intersection of E minus the Fn's, and this will be less or equal than the measure of E minus Fn, which is 1 over n for every n greater than 1, which implies that the measure of E minus F is equal to 0. So in fact, your E is equal to E0, yeah, union, union the Fn's, okay? And what's interesting is that the measure of E0 is 0, and the sequence Fk converges uniformly to F on each closed subset Fn. Okay? So now, this conclusion stays valid even if the measure of E is infinite, it stays valid. How? Okay, so now assume the measure of E is infinite. Okay? What you do, you take E is the union of E intersect uh, minus N, N, N greater or equal than 1. And now, the, this set the measure of E intersect minus N, N, is finite, okay? So, for this set, E intersect minus N, N, is going to be, uh, because of N, so I need to find the right notation, huh? so we're going to put E0 of N, and the union of this F, uh, K of N, Okay, from 1 to infinity. So what do we have? We have that the measure of E0 of n is equal to 0, and the sequence fi, because I use already k and n, that's why, converges uniformly to f on each fk of n. So now, what is our e now? e is going to be the union of all the e0n's from 1 to infinity. Union, union of all this fk of n for k and n. Okay? So you see, what's interesting is that the measure of this set here has 0, Okay? And obviously, the sequence converges uniformly to F on each F K of N. So these are the closed sets. So you have a countable. So here, you have a set of measures 0. And you have here a countable union of say, an F sigma, by the way, uh, of closed sets such that the F, uh, the sequence, the original sequence of functions converges pointwise to F on each one of them, on each of these 
closed subsets, okay? Uh, again, uh, I don't want to go over a uh, simple proof that, in fact, these conclusions are valid if we assume almost everywhere, not pointwise, what they just discovered, okay? What they just discovered. Um, so this is just some basic remarks about the theorem of Igorov. And uh, if we want to go next to what we, is known as the losing, uh, uh, losing theorem, but before that, I need to make some comment. Uh, uh, let's take um, uh, this is known as the little wood, sorry, little wood second principle. Okay, so let uh, f be a simple function uh, defined on measurable subset E. So for every epsilon, there exists F subset of E closed subset. There exists G defined on R to R continuous. Okay, such that the measure of E minus F is less than epsilon and F is equal to G on F. Okay? Great. So this is known as little with second principle. So this is just to tell you what, that a simple function can be almost approximated by a continuous function. On. So it's almost continuous. That's what I mean. It, uh, almost not in the sense uh, f is close to g. No, no, f is equal to g. No, no, f is almost comes from the fact that uh, the subset, capital F, is chosen as close as you want to e. That's what I meant by almost. It is a continuous almost on, a, on the entire e. Okay? So, what is the proof? So, first of all, your f is a simple function. So, you know that your f is a sum of a i key of e i finite and we assume that a i's are different from a j's and this implies that e i are disjoint okay so now for every uh, uh, e i we know that we're gonna find a closed subset so here for every i, okay, pick a closed subset. So remember, you can find either an, an open subset uh, bigger than e i or a closed subset smaller than e i, such that the measure of e i minus f i is as as small as you want. So here we'll take smaller than epsilon over. Uh, n plus 1, for example. Okay? There is no need because uh, the sum, they are finite, it's a finite sum. Now, if it were an infinite sum, it would take 2 to the power or something. But here it's just finite, so we divide by uh, n plus 1. n will do it anyway. But, okay, so set f or the union of the if i's. Okay, what is interesting about the if i's? First of all, they are closed. A finite union of closed sets is closed, so this f is closed. Moreover, the fi's are disjoint because the ei's are disjoint. So, uh, and fi intersect fj is empty for i different from j. Okay? So now what you do, you consider the function j star from f into r such that when you take the restriction to fi, 
you put a on. Okay? So obviously, uh, we have j star is equal to f on f. Okay? So, what is the measure of uh, uh, e minus f? So, this is the measure of uh, f it was the union, so this is the intersection. So, f was the intersection, sorry. f was, uh, f was, so, this is, e is the union of the EIs minus the union of the FIs, okay? So, this is, the union of EIs minus FIs, okay, which is less or equal than sigma of the measure of EIs minus the FIs. And that's why you need epsilon less than n plus 1 n times, so this will be less than epsilon. Okay? So, what did we find? We found uh, a closed subset F, okay? Here it is, with such that it's close enough to e up to epsilon in terms of measure. We found the function g star, which is equal to f on f. What's interesting is that g star is continuous. Okay? So g star Okay. So we claim that g star is continuous. Okay? Indeed. Uh, let So this, this is uh, just a real analysis exercise. I mean, so uh, it's not like something very profound. And it's very simple to prove that when you have a function defined on a union, a disjoint union of closed sets, and it's constant on each one of them, this function, in fact, is continuous. It's enough for, for G star to be uh, continues on each one of them, okay? Because they are closed. You will see, it's very, very interesting. So let's x0 be an accumulation point of f, okay? And so, because f is closed, there exists i0 because x0 will belongs to f, such that x0 belong to f i0, okay? So, clearly, because the unit, they are disjoint, so this will imply that x0 does not belong to the union of the fi's for i different from i0. This is now imply that x0 belongs to the complement of the fi's. Which is open. This is open. Therefore, there exists delta such that x0 minus delta, x0 plus delta is in the union of the fi's complement. Yeah? So now, for every x, uh, so it's in the complement, huh? So the intersection, sorry. The intersection of x0 minus delta, x0 plus delta, intersect f is exactly x0 minus delta, x0 plus delta, intersect f i0. Okay? And you see, since f is restricted to this open interval, okay, intersect f is constant. A G star, I'm sorry, and there is no F here. G star is constant equal to AI zero. We get what we want. Okay? Great. So we found what? We found that we have a continuous function on F star, F star uh, on F. F is continuous, but the conclusion of the second principle of Littlewood tells us that we have a continuous function on R. And for that, uh, we are going to. Uh, call on Tits extension theorem, 
Okay, so tit extension theorem. Tell us that there exists G continuous on R such that G restricted to F is equal to G star is equal to F. Okay, so this is the final touch that will give us this second principle. So now let us use this to look at the next result of Lucin. So Lucin's theorem. Okay, so we have F, which is defined on a measurable set, measurable function, and E is measurable. Okay, so for every epsilon, there exists G, which goes from R to R, continuous, uh, such that, and F, closed, subset of E, such that the measure of E minus F is less than epsilon, and F is equal to G on F. Proof. Assume first that the measure of E is finite. Okay? Since F is measurable, we're going to approximate f by simple functions, okay? So there exists sequence fn of simple functions defined on E such that fn converges pointwise to f, okay? So this is uh, the approximation by simple functions, okay? So now, for every n, we can use the Littlewood second principle that exists gn from r to r, continuous, okay, and there exists Fn included in E, closed subset, such that the measure of E minus Fn is less than epsilon over 2 to the power n. Okay? So remember, uh, the epsilon was given, sorry, uh, I forgot. Uh, we need to fix epsilon, okay, here. So, uh, sorry, here, we'll add it here. Fix epsilon positive because the conclusion is for every epsilon in the theorem, okay? So we have this, such that gn is equal to fn on fn, okay? So now, a God of theorem, okay, implies uh, the existence of uh, F star closed subset of E such that Fn converges uniformly to F on F star and the measure of E minus F star is less than epsilon, okay? 
Now, let us set f equal f star intersect the intersection of, of all the f ends. Okay? Now, we have e minus f, which is e minus f star union, the union of e minus the f ends. Okay? So, the measure of e minus f is going to be less or equal than the measure of e minus f star plus sigma of the measure of e minus f n for n from 1 to infinity. So you see, this is because the series we divide epsilon by 2 to the power n or n plus 1. doesn't matter. So this will give us what? That the measure of e minus f is less than epsilon for, for this one. Okay? And this one will give us sigma of epsilon over 2 to the power n from 1 to infinity, which is epsilon. And this will be uh, less than 2 epsilon. Okay? So this gives you, uh, you can go back again and divide epsilon by epsilon over 2, and then again as usual. Okay? So it doesn't matter. Okay? So now what happened on that f? So we have an f closer to, so what, so what happened? So we know that f being an intersection of closed set is closed. So f is closed. Okay, subset of E. Okay, what else? We know that F, the Fn, so here we know also that the sequence Fn converges uniformly to F on F. Why? Because F is an intersection of the Fn's and you, are, you have uniform convergence on the Fn. Okay, so, but... Uh, on the Fn, we have each Fn is equal to Gn. So here, since F is included in the Fn, we have... I'm sorry here because maybe I should be careful about using Fk, okay? Instead of... So let's keep N for, for the Fn's, okay? So since F is included in Fn, we have by definition, that's how we came up with the Fn's, that each Fn is equal to Gn, okay, on Fn, which contains F. Okay? So this tells us what? That Gn, okay, converges uniformly to F on F. So, the GNs are continuous, are continuous functions. Okay? So, this implies that F, restricted to F, is continuous. Okay? So now, uh, you use, again, uh, tits extension theorem. There exists G from R to R, continuous, such that G restricted to F is exactly F restricted to F. So that's exactly what we wanted. So we wanted to find the continuous function on, from R to R such that F is equal to G and uh, we have the uh, uh, the uh, conclusion that uh, uh, F uh, uh, is continuous on F and F is very close to E. Okay? So this completes the proof that uh, the conclusion of Lusin's theorem is valid if the measure is uh, finite. So what happened if, assume now, 
the measure of E is infinite. Okay? And uh, set EN is equal to E intersect N N plus 1 for N in Z. Okay? So what is interesting is that these ENs are a disjoint. Okay? So here the ENs are disjoint. Okay, so for every n, for any n in z, now we can use, the because the measure of en is finite, so we can use the, the first part of the proof. So there exists fn in en such that the measure of en minus fn is less than epsilon over, be careful, you cannot take to the power n because n is negative, it can be negative, you are in the, in the set z, so we have to take absolute value of n plus 1. Okay? And gn from r to r which is continuous such that gn is equal to f on fn. Okay? So, let uh, f as you can imagine, the union of all the ends, okay? Now, uh, it's very tricky because this is a, uh, uh, an F sigma, it, uh, this is an F sigma, but I, I will show later on that in fact is not an F sigma, is a closed subset of R. This is really amazing. So a priori it is the what? An F sigma, but in fact it's not an F sigma, it is closed. But let's first focus on uh, showing what's going on with the, uh, 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 the equality and the G. So first of all, what do we have? We have that the ENs are disjoint, and the FN is in EN. So these FNs are disjoint, okay? So, set G hat of X to be sigma of g and n of x key of e n of x for n in z, okay, and this is for every x in f. So let us first focus, because this may sound like we have an infinite, uh, but it's not, okay? So basically, uh, what we are doing, we are looking at uh, the uh, g hat because the fn's are disjoint. So for every x in f, the x belongs to one of the fn's because they are disjoint, okay? In one of the fn's, and therefore, uh, uh, the other ones are all equal zero. So this set, uh, this one, in other words, g hat of x uh, is equal to gn of x for x in fn's. That's one. So you don't have a series, no? you don't have a series, just the restriction of gn on h fn is equal to gn of x. So again, as we said before, we did the proof before, so this g hat, in fact, is continuous. And g hat of x is equal to f on f, because it's equal to gn of x uh, on each fn, and on each fn, the gns are equal to f. Therefore, g hat is equal to f of x on f, okay? So now, again, you use Tietz theorem, okay? So there exists g, which is going from r to r, continuous, such that g restricted to f is exactly what? g hat, this is by Tietz again, extension theorem. And this will imply that g restricted to f would be equal to what? To f on f. 
So we see we have the same conclusion. So how do we finish this theorem? Okay, the theorem will be done if we, we prove that. Uh, so we claim that in fact f is closed. This is very interesting. Okay, so to show that, let x n be a sequence in f which converges such that x n converge to x. And we want to prove that, let us prove that x, in fact, belongs to f. Okay? Great. So since xn converge, okay, it's convergent, then xn is Cauchy. Okay? And what happened is, uh, for every epsilon, for every epsilon, there exists an n such that for every n greater than capital N, absolute value of xn minus xm is going to be less than epsilon for, for every n and n greater than n. Okay? So remember, the uh, fn's. The fn's are, so we have fk, which is in ek, which is e intersect k, k plus 1, okay? So, if epsilon is small enough, okay, so what happens is that you look at that x capital N, okay? So here, uh, you look at that x capital N, in other words, all of them will be in, so this will, what happens is there exists k0 such that all the xn's are in uh, f k, zero union f k zero plus one for every n greater than capital n so if you choose epsilon less like than one third one fourth then this will be true you will not exceed you cannot jump because otherwise it means that you jump by two and you cannot okay and so the, what's what's amazing now is the fact that this set now is closed because it's a union of two closed sets and, and that's how the limit, so here, limit of xn equal x will belong to f k0 union f k0 plus 1, which is a subset of f, and that's how you catch it. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And uh, as I said earlier, this theorem is truly amazing. This Egoroff theorem with its applications. We touch on the little with uh, principles as well as losing theorems and some of the extensions. Thank you for your attention.